This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Kansas City, Missouri. It started as a small fire at a construction site. Then suddenly it exploded with unrestrained fury, instantly killing six firefighters. Later investigators discovered that the blaze had been deliberately set, meaning the deaths were in reality cold-blooded murders. Imagine the eerie feeling of stepping off a train and coming face to face with a total stranger who looks exactly like you. In effect, your mirror image. That is precisely what happened to a soldier named Ken Palmer during World War II. Some 50 years later, he's still searching for his exact double. On a small plane loaded with marijuana crashed in the Virginia countryside, it blew the lid off one of the East Coast's biggest drug rings. Authorities began to close in on the mastermind, a charismatic pilot named Wallace Thrasher, only to hear he had apparently died in Central America. But reports of the drug lord's death may have been a clever hoax. Officials now believe that Wallace Thrasher got away scot-free. Join me for another fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Tonight, a woman named Pam Page is missing. For more than four years, her family has endured the agony of not knowing what happened to her. In 1977, Pam and her husband, Rob, left Arkansas and eventually moved to a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, where they opened a video rental business. Despite one shaky period in 1987, Pam and Rob seemed happy. In fact, on July 7, 1989, Pam went back to Arkansas for a family reunion and told everyone that things were great. Two weeks later, however, on July 22nd, 1989, Rob Page said he noticed that his wife was behaving strangely. During the middle of the night, on the early morning hours of Saturday, uh, Mr. Page awoke and discovered that his wife was not in bed. He went downstairs and discovered her on the sofa. Honey, what are you doing? I just couldn't sleep. My back really hurts. She was going through family photographs, and she was crying. I'll just leave for a little while. She told him that her back was bothering her and that she didn't feel well. And Mr. Page said that he encouraged her to go see a doctor in the morning, and he returned back to bed. Mr. Page said he got up at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning, went downstairs, and found his wife sorting through clothing. Sorting through some clothes for goodwill. I've been wanting to do this for a while. Well, it's almost 8 o'clock. Um, are you going to go down to the shop? I really don't feel very good. Well, you want me to open up for you? Would you? Yeah, sure. Well, that would be good. OK. Well, I, I got the keys, so. OK, thanks. All right. He did leave the home, stated he had trouble starting his vehicle because he has an ignition switch problem, worked on his truck for a little bit, got it started, and went, op went up and opened up the video store. Rob Page said that eight hours later, he came home to an empty house and a letter from Pam. Rob, by the time you read this, I'll be a long way from here. I have thought this thing out, and I've been planning this for several months. The letter stated that Pam had left town with a woman named Sarah. Rob Page claimed he was embarrassed because he thought his wife had left him for a woman. He did not call Arkansas to tell Pam's family. Four days later, however, Pam's oldest sister, Trina, Hi, did call Rob. Trina. I was calling to see how Pam was doing. She's gone. What do you mean, she's gone? Well, 
Well, I came home on Saturday, and, and she left me a letter. It seemed out of character to me uh, for her not to let anyone know that where she was where she was at. But I didn't think about that at first. I just was, had one thing on mine was getting my word to somebody that, that she was missing. By the time you read this, I will be a long way from here. Right one now, by I'm one, sure the members of Pam's home. family called Rob and listened as he read the letter. I thought that, to I thought each that and every out, one, something seemed odd. I thought I would go Rob told them the police had taken a report but Pam's father wanted to see the letter anyway. I'm because I'm not happy. He I'm asked leaving. Rob to fax it to Arkansas. I thought living back home would make me happy. It won't. When I received that faxed letter, I knew that something was bad wrong. For one thing, I looked at the signature. I had birthday cards and uh, letters and so on from Pam, and the, the signature wasn't her signature. Finally, Pam's sister, Jimmy, called the police in Arizona, but they had never heard of the case. The family was stunned. I knew from that second that she was dead. Uh, it, it scared me because I didn't know if we would find her body or if we would know what happened to her. But I, I knew she was dead. I was sure of that. She wouldn't leave under no circumstances she would have let Mama know they were too close. Rob Page told detectives that on the day of Pam's disappearance, he left home around 8 a.m. Later, he went to several auto parts stores, looking without success for an ignition switch for his truck. In the parking lot of one store, the truck finally gave out. Rob said he called home, got no answer, and assumed Pam had gone to the video shop after all. He phoned for a taxi to take him home. Hi, I need a taxi. Rob said he never went into the house, only the garage. He got a part for his truck, hopped on his bike, and went back to the store. When the truck finally started, he drove home and found the letter. The letter stated that Pam had taken all their money, $60,000 in cash, out of the safe at the video store. Rob Page said he went straight to the store, and indeed, the cash was gone. The letter also said that Pam had left the couple's Corvette at a Winchell's donut shop. Rob Page claimed he drove to every Winchell's in the area until finally, the next day, he located the Corvette. Soon, however, police began to question the details of Rob's story. None of the employees at the last auto parts store remembered Rob or anyone asking about an ignition switch. In addition, Rob Page had said his truck, which was very distinctive, was parked at the store for nearly four hours that afternoon. None of the employees ever recall seeing that truck being out front of the store or anyone ever working on it. And one particular employee stated if that truck had been out in front of his business, he would have known it. The police also found it curious that the donut shop where Pam had allegedly parked the Corvette, the shop which had taken Rob Page several hours to locate, was right across the street from the auto parts store. However, police did verify Rob's claim that a cab took him home from that location on July 22, 1989. Next, investigators turned their attention to the letter and the traveling companion named Sarah. Rob said he had never met Sarah, but had heard Pam talk about her. Mr. Page felt that his wife had met Sarah um, at the video store. Um, from checking with the video store, the customers by the name of Sarah, we were not able to find a woman by that name who knew Mrs. Page. Finally, three weeks after Pam Page disappeared, the Arizona State Crime Lab verified that the signature on the letter was almost certainly not Pam's. Mr. Page uh, refused to believe me and was adamant that his wife had, in fact, signed the letter. After continuing to question Mr. Page about the signature on the letter, um, he admitted to me that he, in fact, did sign that letter. Rob Page now became a suspect, and suddenly he began to tell a very different story. 
Mr. Page stated at the Thursday preceding his wife's disappearance that while he was on the family's home computer, he discovered a letter that um, he claims his wife had authored in which, in essence, that she was going to be leaving him. I was working on the computer just now, and I found something very interesting. What'd you find? Mr. Page stated um, he confronted his wife about that letter. Oh, I'm sorry you found this. I wrote this a long time ago. Oh, then you weren't planning to leave me, huh? No, I wasn't. I wrote this when I was upset. Well, then you're not going to take our money and run off, Ron, huh? why do you have to blow everything out of proportion? Let's talk about this when you've cooled down. You come back here. We're not finished. On Saturday, he went to the video store, opened it up, and stayed at the store until about noon. And then he returned home to check on his wife. Rob now told police that when he came home from the video store, he found the house in disarray. Pam? Rob said that all of Pam's clothes, except the items she had set aside for goodwill, were gone. All the family pictures and one of their dogs, a dachshund named Rerun, were missing. Pam's credit cards and house keys were on the kitchen table, but Rob said he couldn't find her driver's license. Rob Page said he went downstairs and added four innocuous sentences to the letter in the computer, printed it out, and signed Pam's name. Then Rob drove the Corvette to Winchell's, went to the payphone across the street, and called a taxi. Mr. Page stated that he fabricated some of the things he did and acted out some of the things that he did because no one would ever believe him that his wife had in fact left him had he not done this. Due to Mr. Page's uh, inconsistent statements um, throughout this investigation, um, and as well as the suspicious circumstances surrounding the disappearance of his wife, um, he was offered a polygraph examination on several occasions um, to eliminate him as a suspect in his wife's disappearance, and he declined to take a polygraph on each occasion that it was offered. Despite the suspicions about Rob Page, there was no evidence that he had done anything wrong except change his story. No charges were filed, and the investigation sputtered to a halt. This is a picture of your sister, Pam. Frustrated, Pam's sister, Jimmy Rice, decided to visit Carol Pate, a psychic in Little Rock, Arkansas, who has worked with the police there for 10 years. Carol had never been to Arizona and knew nothing about the pages. She had only a photograph of Pam to go on. That's very good. Thank you. I just handed her a picture. She put her hand on it and started describing Pam's front room. And, you know, unless you've ever been there, she didn't know if Pam lived in a trailer apartment or whatever, but to describe the downstairs and how you go up the stairs and the balcony and going into a bedroom, you know, she was you knew she was actually seeing all this. I saw her with a man in what appeared to be her house, and she was arguing with him. The argument goes up the stairs. She's going up the stairs. She's going down the hallway. He knocks her to the floor. He's trying to strangle her. He grabs a pillow, and all of a sudden, she's, she's quiet. Then a female comes. She assists him on placing her in the trunk. Now I'm seeing them pull out of the garage, and they're driving. The name Coolidge comes into my mind, and 241. Then I'm seeing a factory, and it's gray in color. It appears to be to my left. And there's a railroad track parallel. And then crossing over the railroad track onto a small road. Then he pulls over on the side of the road and removes the body and begins to dig when he apparently it is deep enough he places her in the grave and then drives away jana thorson 
an Arizona newspaper reporter covering the case was in touch with Pam's family in Arkansas. She decided to check out Carol Pate's three strongest clues, the factory, the numbers 241, and the name Coolidge. Incredibly, Thorson did find a gray factory building near railroad tracks right in Peoria, Arizona. Nearby was a sign with the numbers 241. One of the routes between the Page home and a friend's house passed both of these sites and ended at a street named Coolidge. There is no way of knowing if Carol Pate's information means anything until we know whether Pam Page met with foul play or chose to disappear. From the beginning, Rob Page has maintained that he believes his wife is alive. In a letter to Unsolved Mysteries, he declined our request for an interview, but said that if we air this story, he hoped Pam would be found. Pam Page would today be 36 years old. She has red hair and is five feet, eight inches tall. It was just after Thanksgiving, 1988. Firemen raced to extinguish two small blazes burning at the edge of the city. It was a most routine of calls. Then, in the blink of an eye, one of the fires exploded with unprecedented fury. He could have retired several years ago, but he loved it so much that he just stayed. He wasn't even supposed to have been working. He was filling in for somebody else. I'd rather have him go this way than to lay in a coma or be sick, because that would never be Jim Kilvin. He didn't want to fly an airplane because he didn't want to risk his life on an airplane. And I said, but you risk your life every day being a fireman, and he said, well, he can, he's in control when he's at the fire department. Michael Oldham, Robert McConnon, James Kilventon, Gene Hurd, Thomas Fry, Gerald Halloran. They were among Kansas City's best Six firefighters with more than 100 years of service between them. All have been married, all had children. Underlying the tragedy is the ugly fact that the fires have been deliberately set, and arson means that the deaths are nothing less than cold-blooded murders. In spite of a massive investigation, no charges have been filed, no convictions won. Today, the case remains Kansas City's most notorious unsolved crime. The first minutes gave no hint of what was to come. At about 3.40 a.m. on November 29, 1988, two security guards at a highway construction site discovered a pickup truck in flames. Yes, I, I want to report a fire. <laughs> 71 Highway, southbound lane. Across the street. Some 500 yards away, a second blaze crackled around a storage trailer. Look, there's some, some explosives there that are uh, burning near the fire. OK, we'll get somebody started. The dispatch went to Station 41. Pumper 41, this is a pickup truck. Captain Jim Kilvetton and Fireman Robert McConn and Mike Oldham were out the door in just over 90 seconds. Pumper 41, a pickup truck, 87 South 71 Highway on the west side of the highway. Pumper 41, use caution information from the calling party. There may be explosives stored in that construction site. The pickup truck may be in the construction site. 41's clear. As Pumper 41 whipped through town, Jim Kilvetton's wife, Cecilia, heard the dispatch over the police scanner she kept at work. I just didn't think anything about it at the time, because you'd just go into a regular truck fire down on the highway. 
I just thought it was some teenager's truck, and they said they caught it on fire for insurance reasons. Are you the captain? Right here. Totally involved. We'll be using one small screen. Uh, thanks for getting here so quickly. The, the, the truck's totally flooded. There is a fire on the other side of yes, the highway. Yes, there's explosives. On the other side there. of the yeah. highway? Yes, sir. From the onset, arson seemed probable, given two fires that were apparently started simultaneously. Send another pumper company. The highway construction site, a frequent target of vandals, lay some 10 miles from downtown Kansas City. The burning trailer was located here, perched on a hillside. Roughly 500 yards to the northwest across a highway was the pickup truck. Kilvetton and his crew soon had the truck blaze under control. However, fire still burned unchecked through the trailer. Within minutes, Captain Gerald Halloran, along with Fireman Thomas Fry and Gene Hurd, arrived from Station 30. Pumper 30 is 1097. Hey, Gene, how you doing? Jim, Good. what do we got? Well, Gerald, looks like we've got a pickup down here that we've pretty well got under control. Why don't you go up on top of the hill and handle that? Halloran and his men headed up the hill to work the trailer fire. Pumper 41 stayed behind to wrap up the first blaze. To Captain Halloran, a check of the area suggested that the explosives had been properly stored in clearly marked metal sheds known as bunkers. Just the fact that the bunker was there, in fact, there was two bunkers there, led that captain to believe that's where the explosives was, and this trailer was just a regular, normal construction trailer with tools and equipment in it. And therefore, there was no danger that he was going to put that fire out and they'd be down for the night. Roughly eight minutes later, Captain Kilvetton and his crew joined the others at the trailer. Four oh eight a.m. The battalion chief pulled into the construction site. He was a quarter mile from the flames. Just minutes from one of the worst tragedies in Kansas City history. Chief, you guys are? Oh, we're the security guards. So we're the ones that uh, reported the fire. Uh-huh. Tell me a bit about it. We just got on the scene. Well, my truck was on fire, and they came and took care of that. And I think the firefighters went over to the site across the street. and, and They're down around the trailers there. down there. We understand there's some explosives here in a bunker. Yeah, and, and we think that there's some in the trailers over there as well. The trailers that are on fire? Yeah. Yes. Well, let's get them out of there, John. 107. It was just the loudest noise I'd ever heard. It just kind of went through you. It was just so loud, I can't describe it. I'm, I'm serious, it was just incredible. And we live about 12 miles away from where the explosion was. Knocked me out of bed and I got up and looked to the east and I saw a big, great big ball of fire. And uh, I said to myself, I'm, Gerald's going to have to go to that because that's his district. And I just knew he had to go. I knew he'd be there. Fifteen companies of Kansas City firefighters rushed to aid their comrades but safety considerations forced them to wait, frustrated, on the sidelines. They feared that there were more explosives up there on the hill, and it was still dark. From the sounds of the explosions, they were pretty sure that nobody had survived, and so we made the decision uh, that we were gonna wait until daylight, because we didn't want to go up there and stumble around on, on more explosives and get uh, more people injured and killed. Forty minutes after the initial blast, a second explosion did indeed rip through the site. Pumper 
Pumper 41 or Pumper 30? Answer, Pumper 41 or Pumper 30? Pumper 30, Pumper 41, answer. Pumper 30, Pumper 41, please answer. I knew something had happened. Why couldn't he get to his radio? Or anybody get to the radio? I said, everything will be OK. I just sort of blocked it out of my mind. And then she come through there about five after six, come through the door. He says, they're gone, but legally, they cannot pronounce them gone until the coroner gets there. I said, no way. They're still alive. He said, no, they're gone. His captain came to the door, and when he came in, and I said, don't tell me it isn't true. And I, I just started crying. Daylight revealed a stark landscape. In the dismal aftermath, agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms joined Kansas City Police to sift the wreckage for clues. It was evident that nobody could have survived that. It was just totally devastated. It's just, I, I don't think any of the group that went up there was uh, uh, expecting what we found. I, I don't think anybody had any idea that it was that bad. I'd been in Vietnam and seen B-52 strikes, what the aftermath of those were, and these craters were much larger than 2,000-pound bombs leave. And as we found the firefighters, we came to the last one, he was laying there and his radio was still on. And you could hear the voice of the dispatcher still coming out over the radio, calling. And it just kind of shattered the stillness of it. It's just a very surreal looking scene. A public outcry erupted following the revelation that arson had led to the firefighters' deaths. Angry residents inundated the police department with literally hundreds of leads. The tips have ranged anywhere from uh, someone out trying to steal, someone out just for fun, someone out just because they like to set fires, wanted to see what would happen. Uh, but uh, as time wore on, uh, these leads soon wore out. Meanwhile, federal agents pursued the investigation from a different angle. The highway project had long been the focus of a bitter labor dispute. We know that there was labor unrest and it primarily dealt with union versus non-union companies. We learned that there were a number of violent acts directed at non-union companies. They were putting acid into company equipment. They were putting a dirt into the diesel lines. And there were a, a number of incidents where fire was used to destroy equipment. And, and if you take away the tragedy of that night, of the six firefighters dying, we can look at some of these previous incidents being very similar to what happened that night. You had equipment damaged, and then in this instance, you had a security guard's truck set on fire also. Today, we are... The untimely deaths of the six firemen reverberated across the entire country. Firefighters from every state joined in memorial services at Kansas City's Arrowhead Stadium. To this day, surviving family members have been the focus of unflagging community support. We were all very proud of our husbands, and we were proud of the people in Kansas City because they gave us such support. Everyone was back of us, and we weren't alone. I guess I feel like if I knew who did it, we'd know why they did it, and I don't think they were trying to kill six firemen, but somebody was trying to do something to somebody, and six men are gone, and that's hard to deal with. Today, uh, I think about this case. Tomorrow, I'll think about this case, and I'll think about it until it's resolved.
when we return. The case of the enigmatic Wallace Thrasher, debonair country gentleman and alleged drug lord. On October 17, 1984, Virginia state troopers converged on an eerie scene. A small airplane had crashed in a remote mountain wilderness. Still strapped in the cockpit was a body charred beyond recognition. But it was a plane's cargo that riveted the attention of police. In smoldering heaps strewn over the crash site was 1,200 pounds of high-grade marijuana. Street value, more than $1 million. For the authorities, the crash was something of a godsend. Eventually, they would connect both the plane and the dead pilot to Wallace Thrasher of Bland County, Virginia, one of the most successful and most flagrant drug runners in the eastern United States. Back in high school, when he belonged to the Key Club and the Latin Club, Wallace Thrasher hardly seemed the type to end up peddling drugs. He played on the football team and earned the nickname Squirrel for his ability to outrun trouble. But somewhere along the way, Wallace Thrasher went wrong. Today is whereabouts of the subject of unending speculation. Former associates insist Thrasher died in Central America, but authorities suspect that the Squirrel is once again on the run. From the late 70s to the early 80s, Thrasher's operation flew tons of marijuana and cocaine into the western region of Virginia. Distributors then smuggled the drugs north to Chicago, Detroit, and other big cities. Thrasher often piloted the planes himself, and many of his neighbors seemed to regard him as a kind of local hero. Here in Western Virginia, for probably 200 years, kind of these swashbuckling pirate buccaneer type people out here were the local moonshiners. And to some extent, dope pilots are the modern day moonshiners. It takes the same kind of talents to, uh, to smuggle dope in by air as it does to run a, a load of moonshine. Uh, he was the type of person. He wasn't afraid to let everybody know what he was doing. Uh, basically, everybody that had contact with him at the airport and uh, in the areas where he was doing his drug business knew he was transporting drugs. The rewards of Wallace Thrasher's life of crime were on display for everyone to see. He and his wife owned a 10-acre country estate and surrounded themselves with luxury. What you been doing? Wally uh, Thrasher was uh, a very charming fellow, uh, very generous to his associates and the people who lived around him. He spent money very freely, so there are a great many people who will tell you kind things about him. For nearly a decade, Wallace Thrasher managed to stay two steps ahead of the law until that fateful night when one of his pilots slammed an airplane full of marijuana into a mountainside. It would take two weeks of painstaking investigation to turn up undeniable proof that Thrasher owned the plane. Detectives were planning to move in until this article appeared in the local paper, Wallace Thrasher was dead. Can I help you, gentlemen? Oh, well, we're, we're Soon after, police. Virginia authorities tried to speak directly with Thrasher's wife. No, no, I'm afraid now is not a good time. Well, we read that Wallace Thrasher died. No, that's correct. Exactly how did he die? In a plane crash. He was a pilot. And where did he die? In Jamaica. When did this happen? November 5th. Gentlemen, I'm sorry. I have to go. Goodbye. Thank you. The investigators departed unimpressed. Later, Mrs. Thrasher produced this death certificate as proof of her husband's fatal crash in Jamaica. Still suspicious, police sought to verify the information. The investigation revealed that uh, the death certificate was fraudulent and there was no evidence from any witnesses or anyone in Jamaica that knew of any such crash. The disclosures convinced authorities that Wallace Thrasher was still alive, 
and as a result, they filed charges against him. But with Thrasher's whereabouts unknown, his wife was again questioned by the authorities. Eventually, she agreed to tell investigators what she knew. She began with the night of the crash and confirmed that there had been a second pilot on board the aircraft. Although severely injured, the pilot was able to drag himself to a payphone. Thrasher picked him up at the very moment police were racing to the crash scene. What happened? Oh, my God. God. We've got to get him to hospital. No. Almost immediately, Wallace Thrasher began to assess the damage to his operation. What happened, man? No. We were trying to come in low under the cloud cover. It was just too low, man. I tried to get us out of there. Thrasher was well aware that the plane could be traced back to him, that it was just a matter of time before the authorities would be knocking at his door. I think we got problems. I think we got real problems. We've got to get into a hospital. This is a Later, Thrasher spirited the injured pilot to an out-of-state hospital and dropped from sight himself. Mrs. Thrasher went on to tell police that about two weeks after the crash, her husband stuffed a quarter of a million dollars in cash into a travel bag and departed for the Central American country of Belize. Thrasher had said that he planned to buy a load of marijuana and return to the United States. But some believe Thrasher never intended to come home and that the $250,000 was a down payment on a new life. About a week later, uh, Mrs. Thrasher received a call from two of their Confederates down in Belize, advising her that Mr. Thrasher had been killed on takeoff in a, in a massive crash. My God. The fire had been so intense that literally the plane was burned down to the outline of a plane on the ground, and that there would be very little for, for them to send back and no reason for her to come down. Mrs. Thrasher contacted her attorney with the basic problem of how to handle her husband's estate, how would she inherit things, how would she spend money, uh, take money from accounts, and so forth. In the end, Thrasher's wife admitted she bought the fake death certificate and concocted the tale of a Jamaican plane crash. She had feared that her property would be confiscated if authorities learned her husband was on a drug run when he died. But even the crash in Belize started to seem like a fabrication after one of Wallace Thrasher's former associates showed up in May of 1986. So, what'd you find? Well, I went to Belize to the spot where the plane went down, and apparently the fire was really bad. So the guys just bulldozed whatever was left into a hole, and the fire was so bad there wasn't much. I did get some proof, though. I got that from one of the guys that uh, was there when he crashed. The ring was in perfect condition, the inscription as sharp as the day it had been engraved. For detectives, that was part of the problem. Mrs. Thrasher did advise me it was definitely Wally Thrasher's wedding ring. We find it kind of tough to believe that a, uh, uh, an aircraft could go in with that amount of fuel caused that amount of destruction to the point where literally the, the uh, substructure of the plane was melted and the, pin, and the uh, ring itself would still uh, be in that kind of condition. A decade has passed since Wallace Thrasher left for Belize with a change of clothes and a quarter of a million dollars. Did he perish in a fiery crash in the jungles of Central America? Or did the squirrel once again dash to freedom. I think that uh, at the time that Mr. Thrasher disappeared, he was facing a lot of different problems, and it may have been an opportune for him to, as they say, exit stage left. We know that he was having problems within his own organization. He knew that if he got caught this time, it wouldn't be a matter of 18 months at a country club. It would be some serious prison time. So I think it was an excellent uh, time for him to make that decision if he was going to make it. This photograph shows Wallace Thrasher at about the age of 36. He has graying hair, an athletic build, and stands 5 feet 10 inches tall.
Next, the amazing encounter of two lookalikes, identical strangers who may in fact be long lost blood relatives. What are the odds that somewhere in the world is another person who looks exactly like you? One in a million, one in 50 million? The chances of actually standing nose to nose with your double seem beyond calculation. And yet around 50 years ago, that is precisely what happened to a young soldier named Ken Palmer. Tonight, with your help, he hopes to beat the odds again. In December of 1943, Ken Palmer was a newly commissioned second lieutenant in the Army Air Corps on his way from Texas to Wisconsin. During a momentary stop to change trains in Cincinnati, Ohio, Ken had the most remarkable encounter of his life. Ken sensed that someone was staring at him. A quick glance told him why. Incredibly, improbably, Ken Palmer had found his exact double. I was amazed. And both of us saw it, and both of us reacted so much to it. Both of us set down our bags and, and stared. And until I got a uh, hold of myself and extended my hand, uh, he didn't move. He was just frozen, looking at himself in a different uniform. <laughs> I'm Ken Palmer. My name is Palmer. My first thought, of course, was Palmer. that no. he's, yes. he's closely related. Look, my father is from Brownsville, Minnesota, just across from La Crosse, Wisconsin. Do you know Brownsville? Mm, no, I have no family there. We began to exchange our father's names, our grandfather's names, our, uh, where we lived, things of this nature. Uh, and that didn't get it. My grandfather's from Brownsville. Surprisingly, the two men could not find a single relative in common. But when Ken began to recount an old family legend, he was stung by the stranger's response. My family often talks of this uh, lost treasure in India. Two Palmer brothers were at a uh, party in the court of St. James. Yeah. They, uh, they cut the, uh, the queue off a court official. Yeah, that's right. They had to flee England. I mean, that's the story. Left a fortune. Well, not alone did he know about it, yes. he added details that I checked out with Dad later, and uh, they were accurate, uh, things that I didn't know. Uh, so it was, it, it, it was perfectly obvious that we were related, and yet we couldn't understand how we could be. Oh. This is my train. I've got to go. Look, it's do, you, be, uh, uh, do you have a pen? Yeah, yeah, yeah I got one. You yeah. write down your name and address. When I get back home, I'm going to contact you. This is good. This is good. Do. I will. I took uh, we'll... his name and address, oh, yeah. stuffed it in my pocket. Uh, I'll write you. Goodbye. Bye. I picked up my luggage and scooted off from my train. If I'd had the sense that God gave geese, I would have stopped right then, and uh, we would have spent some time together. When I got on the train and settled, I reached in my pocket to get that slip of paper. It wasn't there. It all fell apart at that moment. I, I was devastated. Ken Palmer never saw his double again, and all attempts to find the man have been unsuccessful. These pictures of Ken Palmer were taken in the 1940s. The man he met at the train station so long ago was virtually identical. Like Ken, his last name was Palmer. His first name may have been Robert or James. Ken believes the man lived in the eastern United States, possibly New Jersey. At the time, 
Ken's double was either a technical or staff sergeant in the Army Air Corps. I would like very much to find him and or uh, part of his family. Doggone it, how many times are you going to walk across the station and see that double? Out of all of the people in the United States, out of everybody uh, that uh, that could happen. That split-second timing when in this great crowd and all these people, we walk into one another and we set down our bags and stare at one another. Magical moment. <laughs> Join me next Friday. Perhaps you hold the key. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Thank you.